Hi everyone, welcome back. You know, everyone likes to think that they're Marty McFly, but I think realistically we're probably all George. So when I think about what my favourite movie of all time is, there's a few that come to mind. One film that I think is fantastic is Bo Burnham's Eighth Grade, but is it my favourite? Probably not. Stand By Me is another one, and that's top 10, but again, not really my favourite. In recent years I developed what you might call a borderline obsession with the movie Dazed and Confused. It's the movie that I most frequently recommend to people when they ask me for something to watch. When it comes to movies that I've discovered in the last five years, I think that is the number one spot. But my first love has always been Back to the Future. I first watched Back to the Future on a VHS tape when I was eight years old, using the only VCR our family had in the house at the time, which was built into an old TV and sat on a pedestal in the corner of the kitchen. Later that year at school, everyone in the class had to give a presentation that could be about anything. And I was so enthralled by this movie. The eight-year-old me stood up in front of the entire class and gave a presentation about Back to the Future. And I think that's when I peaked. At the end of the VHS there was a trailer for part two, which was a movie that we didn't own. And I remember just how much I wanted, no, I needed to see that movie. You're telling me that Marty goes to the future? And there's a third part? A couple of years later I finally got the DVD trilogy and I watched those three movies endlessly. To make a long story short, I love these movies. I think the first one is better than the others, sure, but they're all great movies regardless. All of that aside, you might remember that at the end of the first movie, Marty McFly returns from 1955 to 1985. And just as he's settling back in, Doc Brown shows up again to get him to come with him to 2015. He's barely even walked through the door, it's really bad. Doc doesn't give Marty any time to breathe before he's being whisked away on another time travelling adventure. And then part two starts with the exact same scene that part one left off in albeit with a different actress playing Jennifer because the old one couldn't do it anymore. And then the second movie just goes from there. And then similarly, part three ends where part two left off. So the whole trilogy is continuous, right? In fact, even more than that, the trilogy actually overlaps with itself because, as I said, the ending of part one is the beginning of part two, and the ending of part two is the beginning of part three. There's no gaps of time where the characters go about their daily lives. Like what I'm saying is, we don't get back to the future part 1.5, Marty renews his passport. It's just a few crazy weeks in their lives, and then that's it. Sort of. The Back to the Future wiki has a fantastic page documenting everything that happens over eight different timelines. They even calculated that over the course of the trilogy, Marty experiences a total of 18 days, 7 hours, and 51 minutes, which is incredibly specific. But this got me thinking. Because this is a trilogy about time travel, those 18 days are scattered over something like 130 years. And if it happened normally, they're all sort of mismatched. So I wonder what it would look like on a normal timeline. And so I did something dumb. <laughs> So I've taken to calling this project the Back to the Future Supercut, and this has been something I've had the idea to do since before I started making these sorts of videos on this channel. First off, this is not as easy as it might sound. You might think that because part 1's the 50s movie, part 2's the future movie, and then part 3's the western movie, you just put it 3, 1, 2, and then you're done. But not quite. Each movie jumps back and forth through different time periods, and also through different versions of those same time periods. So recutting the trilogy results in this jumbled mess where you might have a scene from part one, followed by a scene from part two, then back to part one, and then a scene from part three. So to make this simpler, let's start by deconstructing the timeline as it's presented to us in the trilogy. Obviously we'll start with part one, and it just so happens that part one is the easiest timeline to understand. The basic format as it's ordered in the movie is this. Marty starts in the pre-movie state status quo world, which for the purpose of simplicity we'll refer to as Bad 1985. Not to be confused with Worse 1985, which comes later. Bad 1985 is the world where his dad's getting pushed around by Biff, his mum's an alcoholic, and Doc gets shot. Sorry for the spoilers, but really? Marty then travels back in time to 1955. There's no need to call this one good or bad, because there's only ever one 1955. Okay, technically if you want to get specific you could say there's loads of different 1955s, because there's the one where Marty never goes back in time, the one where Biff never gets the almanac, the one where Doc never goes to 1885, etc, etc. But because all of those events never cause any conflict with each other in that year, from the viewer's perspective, there's only ever one 1955. Anyway, back to part one. After spending most of the movie in 1955, Marty changes the future for the better. He then travels to good 1985, where he finds that Doc is still alive and his life is completely different. Then Doc shows up again and they set off to 2015. Are you with me so far? I'll take that as a yes. So next up in part two, 
Doc, Marty and second Jennifer travel to 2015 where old Biff steals the time machine. They then travel back to worse 1985, fight Donald Trump Biff, then travel back again to 1955 to get the almanac back from 50s Biff while part one Marty is doing whatever it is that part one Marty does. Then Doc in the DeLorean gets struck by lightning and part two Marty finds 50s Doc right after part one Marty travels back to good 1985. Right, part two Marty then becomes part three Marty who's still in 1955. He finds the DeLorean buried underground as it was left by 1885 Doc. Marty then travels to 1885 himself where the majority of part three happens. He then returns to good 1985, the DeLorean's hit by a train, Doc then shows up in a train, way to rub it in Doc, and then that's the end of the trilogy. When you try to account for all the in-universe timelines that happen both on and off the screen, this can get pretty complicated, but thankfully we're only concerned with the date of what's happening on screen. But even with that simplifying things for us, there are still some key issues that arise. Like what happens when there are two Martys, or the overlapping scenes. So I've come up with a few basic rules to keep things consistent. Rule one is no double scenes. This means that where there are scenes that repeat themselves, like the one where Marty finds 50s Doc at the end of part two and the beginning of part three, we just keep one in the supercut. The one that gets to stay in is the most complete. So in this case, it's the one in part two because it's ever so slightly longer. This rule doesn't apply, however, for the same scene from different perspectives. So when Doc gets shot 30 minutes into part one and he gets shot again an hour and 40 minutes into part one, even though they're the same event, they both get to stay because they're shown from two different perspectives. Rule two is the earlier movie takes precedence, meaning that if two different events are happening at the exact same time, like Marty being in Strickland's office while George punches out Biff, the one in the earlier movie gets put in first. So in this case, it's the one where George punches out Biff. And then lastly, rule three, I like to call the double Jennifer rule. So as I mentioned earlier, Jennifer's played by two different actresses, Claudia Wells and Elizabeth Shue. For most of the trilogy, this doesn't really matter, except for the overlapping scene in part one and two, which by the way, they had to recreate shot for shot several years later, and it's really cool to see the comparison side by side. Anyway, all the double Jennifer rule really is, is that Jennifer number two gets to stay because she has more screen time over the entire trilogy. You could probably explain this in universe by saying that Marty going back in time and changing his future caused some butterfly effect that meant that Jennifer looked different, but who cares? I guess this rule is kind of just rule one. But by doing this, I'm also breaking rule two. But who cares? This is my edit, I can do what I want. And with those rules decided on, I started the editing process. And now I'm pleased to present to you the Back to the Future Super Cut. Okay, I'm not actually going to upload the whole thing to YouTube, or anywhere for that matter, because I'll just get destroyed by copyright. But I won't leave you hanging, I at least want to give you a basic rundown of my magnum opus. It's over five hours long, and it's real weird. The movie opens in 1885, right as the DeLorean emerges and almost drives straight into the Pahatchee tribe. Marty is taken in by the McFlies, and the entire western segment of part three continues as normal. Doc and Marty take their photo in front of the clock face, Clint Eastwood faces down against Mad Dog Tannen, Clara and Doc end up together, and Marty disappears into Eastwood Ravine. And then reappears on Saturday, November 5th, 1955, at 6.15am at Twin Pines Ranch. This transition is kind of okay, because the 1885 stuff ends with Marty disappearing in the DeLorean, and the 1955 stuff begins with him reappearing. We're over one hour into the movie at this point, and this segment too continues as normal. Marty walks into town and accidentally runs into his dad. He's hit by a car and taken in by the driver where he meets Lorraine. He finds Doc, they set about on a plan to get Marty back to 1985, while he tries to make sure his parents get together. You know how it goes. Finally, just after the two hour mark, Marty hatches a plan with George to get George and Lorraine together at the dance. And then a second Doc and Marty appear in 1955 to get a previously unmentioned almanac back from Biff. And this is where the supercut really starts to show its stuff. The next part plays out like the 50 section of part two, but with both perspectives interwoven, which is pretty cool. Marty too jumps in the back of Biff's car and Biff drives off. Doc 2 then arrives at Biff's house looking for him. Meanwhile, Marty 1 and Doc 1 are starting to set up their weather experiment. Marty 1 writes a letter to Doc 1 warning him that he'll be shot in 30 years time. And I've always thought, can you imagine how strange it would be carrying around a letter written 30 years ago warning that you'll be shot by someone? Biff makes his way to the tunnel with Marty in the back, while Doc 2 bumps into Doc 1 and hands him a three quarter inch wrench. Marvin Berry and the Starlighters are busy playing the Enchantment Under the Sea dance when Biff arrives. As Marty 2 is trying to get the almanac back from Biff, Marty 1 then arrives at the dance with Lorraine, and they 
park. Then Strickland confiscates the almanac and Marty 2 follows him while Marty 1 gets thrown out of the car by Biff. George McFly tries and fails to confront Biff. Marty 2 is now in Strickland's office. He gets the copy of Ooh La La, not quite what he wanted, and then he runs outside to see George deck Biff. Dismayed that his picture hasn't returned back to normal, Marty 1 pushes through the crowd to find Marvin Berry, just as Marty 2 arrives on the scene to perform CPR with my favourite minor character of the series. He just took that guy's wallet! Marty 2 then runs into Biff's gang again, while Marty 1 plays Earth Angel one-handed edition, followed by Johnny B. Good. Parts of Johnny B. Good get replayed as per rule 2, as Marty 2 defeats Biff's gang and escapes the auditorium shortly before Marty 1 emerges to be told about his interesting music by Lorraine. Why don't you just come out and say it, Lorraine? Watching through the window, Marty 2 is confronted by Biff, who gets the almanac back. Marty 2 and Doc 2 then set off in the DeLorean to chase after him. The tunnel scene and the Western Union scene then play out just as they did in part 2 originally. But then, just as Marty 2 declares there's only one man who can help him, we cut to the lightning storm from part 1. After a lot of action, Marty 1 successfully travels back to 1985, and then immediately reappears again as Marty 2. Fade into Doc's house, where the 50s segment at the beginning of part 3 continues as normal, until Marty sets off in the recovered time machine at the Hatchy driving just before the three and a half hour mark. As he travels through time, cut to black for a few seconds, and then fade in to Friday, October 25th, 1985, 8.18am, and the sound of ticking clocks. We then get the opening of part one with Bad 1985 and Old Jennifer, up to the point where Doc shows Marty the flux capacitor for the first time, and tells him to put on a radiation suit. Then, in the courthouse square, Marty returns from 1955, and runs off to see if he can save Doc before it's too late. Back at the Twin Pine slash Lone Pine Mall, it sort of jumps back and forth in this segment, Libby and terrorists show up, shoot Doc, and chase Marty, causing him to accidentally time travel. After watching himself travel back in time, Marty runs to check on Doc, and finds that he survived the attack because he figured, what the hell. After returning home, Marty wakes up at 10.28am in good 1985 to find his life is completely different. After meeting new Jennifer for the very first time in this edit, Doc shows up from 2015 to bring them both with him. Then they travel to 2015, but we leave them for now and cut to Doc and Marty arriving in worse 1985. Worse 1985 happens to all conveniently take place on Saturday night to Sunday morning, whereas the stuff from good 1985 happens on Saturday morning and later on Sunday morning. So there's actually no conflict here, and all of the worst 1985 stuff happens as it does in the original movie. Once Doc and Marty leave Worst 1985 to go back to 1955 to fix everything, we go back to Good 1985 at the end of part 3 as Marty arrives on the train tracks. The DeLorean is destroyed, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers has his greatest acting moment, and the movie ends as normal, which would otherwise be the end of this trilogy but we've still got all of that 2015 stuff to go. This is taking a really long time to explain, isn't it? I mean, it is three movies, so what do you expect? Right as the time machine flies away, we cut to the flying highway on Wednesday, October 21st, 2015, at 4.29pm, at around the 4 hour 40 mark. And all of the future scenes from part 2 happen in order like they do in the movie. It takes 5 hours of running time to find out about the origin of the almanac, which up to this point we've seen in several different time periods. And finally, after more than 5 hours and 15 minutes, the supercut ends, with Doc, Marty and Jennifer travelling back to worst 1985. And there you have it, the entire Back to the Future trilogy in chronological order. This was dumb. This was really dumb. I'm not suggesting at all that you watch this trilogy in order because it doesn't really make any sense like this, but it was kind of fun to see how it all fit together. With the movie ending with them travelling back to the 1985 that Biff is in charge of, it makes the ending really dark. On a linear timeline, that's the final moment, so I guess that makes that the ending of this story, which makes this version of the movie a really confusing tale about a cowboy and his blacksmith friend who continuously try and better their lives, only to jump forward in time to a different time period where it's all worse until they finally get to the point where they forever doom themselves to be stuck in the worst possible timeline, controlled by a monster. So basically the Trump presidency. <laughs> A great family movie. But in all seriousness, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've had this idea for a while, and I'm glad that I finally got to put it together and try something different. Let me know if there's something you'd like to see next, and I'll see you next time. Bye.